So, welcome to the session. My name is Paul Tizard. I'm a fear of flying coach, which I've been doing for over 20 years. And today I'm talking turbulence, turbulence tips. So as I was preparing for this, I was thinking to myself, what would be useful? So I've tried to break it down into three areas and I am a fear of flying coach and not a pilot. So even though I've been listening to pilots talk about turbulence for the last 25 years, I am no expert in it, but I do have some really useful tips that will be able to help you uh, if you have that particular fear. So I just want to welcome all the new audience that have joined today. So thank you very much for that and welcome. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about what causes it in normal speak in session one. What causes it? Uh, why people fear it? Maybe that's obvious to you, but there are different reasons. And thirdly, what practical things can you actually do about it? So what causes it, why people fear about fear it, and what practical things you can actually do about turbulence? Okay, so the first thing, what causes it? Now I could bore you and I've got some charts here and I could look at those and talk you through them and I've now broadly understand what this turbulence kind of looks like. Well, it doesn't look like anything, you can't see it, but you can predict it. You can get weather charts, you can sort of suggest that there may be turbulence around here because we've got this, this air stream here and we've got these particular pressure. Go but at the end of the day, all of that doesn't help you. So turbulence is caused by movement of air. It's as simple as that. Air is always moving. What right do we have to, to, to demand that it doesn't? And air moving is quite a good thing. Uh, pilots love it. Pilots love a breezy day because it gives them extra lift. So when you're looking at air, which you can't see, but when you're thinking about turbulence, I'm looking for it, I'm checking the weather charts and I'm, I'm preparing, preparing, preparing. Oh my goodness, what's the word? And then you'll Google, where's the worst turbulent flights? Is it worse at day or night? You know, all that sort of stuff. You can't really predict it. We can make our best guess. And there are operations departments and the Met Office and lots of other places that the pilots can tap into to find out what's it going to be like? What's the ride going to be like? How turbulent or choppy is it going to be? But actually, we don't always know. So let's just keep it really simple. Let's just say it's movement of air. And that can happen as you're taking off, like because of the, the, the wind buffeting against the buildings around airports. It could happen as you're going through some clouds because there's a bit of movement of air there. Uh, it could happen because it's a particularly windy day. You could be in the jet stream. There's loads and loads of reasons that you can have movement of air, but let's just face the facts here. Air moves. Okay, so not much you can do about it and it's not a bad thing. So I'll talk about practical things. You can think about that in a minute, but the, the straight off the bat here is that air is movement. Okay, and, and in fact, no, I'll come back to that later. So air moves. That's what turbulence is. So for whatever reason, it just moves. All right. So why do people fear it? I think it's the lack of control and people look around and they can see the wings flapping up and down. I think, oh, my goodness, what on earth does that mean? And we can feel some movement, but we can't really calibrate to what's going on. And perhaps we have the sensation of dropping. You know, that one just after takeoff, that that dropping about uh, about one or two minutes afterwards when they change the nose pitch. That's a drop. <laughs> it's not actually, but our body thinks it is. And as we're going along, because we can't really calibrate literally how smooth it is, any change of direction uh, in terms of altitude, we feel it, particularly the down bits. And it always feels much worse than it is because you've got no references. You can't calibrate against a cloud. We've moved because you're passing that cloud at 500 miles an hour, for example. So even when we do change altitude quickly, you notice I'm avoiding the word drop because we don't drop. You're doing it over a distance. So if you're rocketing along at 500 miles an hour, and you change altitude by 100 relative feet. That sounds really dramatic, but you're not, it's not that 
change it's that change and if you can see my this is an aircraft by the way uh, so for those <laughs> just listening right now I'm trying to demonstrate an aircraft going on with my hand and it so if it's changing a hundred feet in relative terms you are spreading that over god knows how what the distance is i can't do the maths but we're going at 500 miles an hour and you change altitude by 100 feet yes 100 feet in broad if i was to drop you now two feet you'd probably feel that and notice it and you might even get hurt but 100 feet in a protected aircraft over a distance going at 500 miles an hour well it's like a, a, a ship going through the waves you know it's like it moves air moves you know that's that's the big deal so when we are feeling that kind of drop we are just feeling it because that's not actually what's happening so I think people fear it because they don't understand what's going on and our brain our primitive brains which haven't really changed that much over thousands of years don't really know what to do with it and you think how long's commercial aviation been around what 100 years or something and we're supposed to just love it the reality is we haven't evolved we're no different to our cave forebears you know cave dwelling forebears that they could have could have taken one of those cave people shoved them in an aircraft now and they'd have the same sort of balance systems we have now we're used to sort of being ground dwelling humans and so when we leap up into the air and we're going through all this sort of strange movement we're not birds and we can't really make sense of it so our primitive systems can't make sense of it and so we are desperate for information and we fill in the gaps what might be going on and so when we feel a movement we don't tend to feel the uppy bits we tend to feel the downy bits that's very technical speak i realize uh, our brains are struggling to make sense of that and going oh no for that clearly it was a plummet okay and this this is a near death near death experience and what happens is then a little bit of folklore around well you know if you fly to Tenerife you're always going to get turbulence or if you fly and, and sometimes there could be trends because of the routing that you're doing but most of the time it's absolute nonsense okay so it's just it becomes myth the stuff of myths and fantasy you know well if you well everybody knows if you take a night flight on a you know this type of aircraft or if you fly easyjet you're going to get more turbulence so it's, it's rubbish it's all rubbish because it's just air it's there all the time the air doesn't care it's just there and it moves and our job is to go through it and make the most of it and we use the air the principles of air we observe the rules of physics and so we're in the air and the air is supporting us it's all around in fact it's not really supporting us it's sucking us up but that's a subject for another lecture and I'll probably get a pilot in who can describe it much more succinctly than I would but we're being sucked into the air and so as long as there's air and we're moving forwards which is ideal with engines and stuff and even without engines as you know we can still move forward anyway that's another topic again as long as we're moving forward and there's air which there always is we've got lift sometimes that lift can get a bit bobbly and sometimes we have to think of ourselves what's what was causing this and so I don't stand it so what can we do about it so we've talked about so far what causes turbulence and I've made it really simple it's just any time there's movement of air and air is always moving what right do we have to demand it not to yeah fair enough and why do people fear it because I think they think there's going to plummet they're going to fall out the ground they're going to be out of control the wings moving that's just not natural and uh, is there air pockets as we all know no such thing as air pockets it was a term made up by the media years and years ago but it still seems to be popular still gets used in newspapers and stuff like that because there is a lot of urban myth about it oh it's it's an air pocket it was a plummet situation we fell now we don't always help ourselves in the aviation industry because sometimes we don't use helpful language so I've heard pilots quite often say and and, and cabin crew as well uh, we may hit some turbulence we may hit some turbulence so in the mind's eye of the nervous flyer that's like a wall isn't it hit oh my god we're going to hit a wall of turbulence is it, and although you may not have noticed that because it becomes common language 
that people on PAs in commercial aviation do, and I'm guilty of them as well. Uh, when we're not mindful of what we say, we can say, you know, it's going to be a bit bobbly. We, we're expecting some, tur we may hit some turbulence about halfway across the Atlantic. And then people are sat there bracing themselves, waiting for it. And sometimes it doesn't even arrive. Bloody turbulence, can't even rely on it. So that's the thing, you see, we, we have to be really careful what we say about it. So sometimes when, we use it, when pilots will tell you, the ride report. Well, okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the pilot voice. Uh, we like to hit some turbulence, hit some turbulence, uh, probably halfway through the flight, and then it's smooth sailing for the rest of the flight. So what if it isn't? So what if we don't hit that turbulence hit uh, halfway across, and then it isn't smooth sailing for the rest of the flight? You bastard, you lied to us. So it's very easy to be hanging on to the words, listening, because I know when you're a nervous flyer, that's what you do. But when we get into now, what can you actually do about it at a practical level? And I'm going to give you some choices here, OK, because you can't control the air. Can we accept that? You can't predict when it will be turbulent or not. So many people have told me that they, they look at the charts and they go, well, it's a bit windy today and uh, I think it's going to be raining, so it's going to be turbulent. But you can get just as much turbulence or movement of air on a sunny day the pressure differences so it's no guarantee of what's going to happen so i would say stop doing it which is where it gets us to the third section what can you do about it at a practical level so practically so let's talk about the aircraft the aircraft super super strong okay if you could see some of the well i've been in simulators when we're going through turbulence etc to show what the aircraft will do and even at its worst turbulence that we're trying to create it's still, it, it's no it's no harm whatsoever to the aircraft. And I don't know if you ever watched any of those videos which show some of the testing that they put aircraft through. So making the wings bend and all the rest of it to see how far they go and wobble them up and down. Uh, a bit like they did with that Ikea bed, you know, they're testing how durable the bed was by, yeah, anyway, that's another advert that was out a few years ago. <laughs> So what they do is they put these aircraft into beds and they test them to see what it takes to, to try and shake them apart. And these things are just much, 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 much stronger than they'll ever be. And turbulence, turbulence will never harm an aircraft. There you go, you've heard it. It's official. You can quote me on that. Turbulence cannot harm an aircraft. However, you can be harmed during turbulence if a few things happen. So, for example, the pilots put on the passenger seat belts and you think I'm all right and you keep walking about so I would always check with the cabin crew and just say I, I'm desperate to use the loo or whatever you want to do and uh, do you mind if I just is it okay and they might say oh well safety uh, but that's up to you but ultimately they'll give you some sort of idea yeah, you probably are going to be OK, so make your way to the toilet or it's going to I'll probably turn them off. Let me just check with the pilots, give it 10 minutes and then you'll be all right. OK, so that's one reason why people might get hurt, because it only takes a movement of a couple of feet for people to stumble. And that's because we're squishy, aren't we? Compared to an aircraft, which is firm and strong, we're squishy. <clears throat> so when we fall, it hurts us. And that's the only reason you're going to get hurt uh, during turbulence. Well, the second reason could be if the turbulence is a sudden jolt you know sometimes you feel those ones which would be a surprise uh, but a hat rack could open you know an overhead bin what they call them nowadays uh, and so if there's something loose up there that could fall on you so that's a potential uh, somebody who's up you know the errant passenger wandering around or oh, more uh, turbulence they could fall on you so that's why you might get hurt so that's the only reasons I can think of because if it's really bad and it's really bumpy, see there I go again, if it's really bad, it's not bad, it's just a bit more bumpy sometimes, okay? If it is bumpy, then the cabin crew might be asked to sit down because, for fear of spilling hot liquids on you, for example. So that's a fourth way you might get hurt. But those are the only ways you'll get hurt during turbulence if you keep your seatbelt on. I always suggest, because the pilots do this as well, keep your seatbelt on for the whole flight. You don't have to have it strapped in, you know, like in the brace position. You can just put it on so it's just across your lap. And then if you want to go to sleep, you won't get woken up by the cabin crew when they're checking, doing their security checks during turbulence. 
and it also means if the aircraft moves and you're attached to it, no harm will come to you. OK, so that's tip number one. Tip number two, remember that air moves all the time. So we need to rebrand turbulence and just call it movement of air. It's not as catchy, is it? Turbulence has much more dramatic air movement. That's all it is. So we need in our minds to just rebrand it and just think it's just air moving. Air always moves. As long as there's air, then there's movement. Now, another way to look at the idea of uh, turbulence and air moving, you could actually say this is proof that there's power. You ever thought about it like that? That there's power, that there's, even though we weigh 400 ton, not individually, but as an aircraft, uh, 400 tons, and we're rocketing along at 500 miles an hour, the air has such power, it not only can lift us, but it can all just jiggle us about a bit. That's how much power is out there. Okay, but like I said before, turbulence will not harm an aircraft. It might harm you if you're strapped in, etc., or a naughty passenger falls on you. Okay, so when we think about it like that, air just moves. It's all right. It's just movement and it's okay and it's not going to affect me because I'm strapped in. All right, job done. Now, lastly, what else can you do about it? A couple of other things, actually. Uh, one of my favourite tricks, and this was first taught to me by a guy called Captain Norman Lees. I'll just see if I can show you this. It's a water bottle. And I'm also advertising IATA, which is um, the safety lot. So if you ever want to read up any research or articles around IATA, that's a good agency to look into. An organisation that serves the aviation community, talks a lot about um, safety, etc, etc. Anyway, but when we have a water bottle and whenever you're looking at a water bottle or a cup of water you can see you can't see but i can see but even just holding it there's a slight wobble to it and the reason for that is that this is just like normal so this would be like light turbulence with a normal so you could grab a bottle of water now or a cup of water and just try and hold it steady with your hand and look at it it's moving that's what light turbulence is like and so it's worth thinking about that so when Co Captain Norman who was one of the first pilots that I worked with when I set up the Virgin Fly Without Fear program in 20, uh, 1996 and it was just me David Lando Norman Lees and we were just going through what, what do people actually need we, we noticed straight away that turbulence came up so for the last 25 years we've been talking turbulence and this was a trick that Norman taught me then and then we kind of forgot about it and then we had a change of therapist came in and a great human called Gillian Harvey Bush came in and reminded us of this lovely tip that we sort of forgotten about but that is a great great tip because it allows the rational part of your brain to look at the water the level and kind of go well, if the water's doing that, but my stomach feels like it's doing a lot worse, what do I believe? My brain and my eyes, what I'm looking at, or my stomach, which is not a particularly calibrated instrument in terms of uh, working out what level we're flying at or what movement we've just encountered. It's not an altimeter, is it? For goodness sake. So we have to look at this water thing. I think this is a rational, logical way of thinking about what actual movement is happening versus what it feels like. I mean, the last thing I want to say about it, aside from the fact that we do need to rebrand it, perhaps we need to be a bit braver with it. So all of my family, we love turbulence because it's sort of, because we know it's not a harm to us. So we just think, well, bring it on. So maybe that'd be something that might help you. It's just to think, well, I know that nothing's going to happen to the aircraft. No harm will come to me because I've got my seatbelt on. So I might not like it, but it doesn't mean I'm unsafe. OK, so just because I don't like it doesn't mean anything. You don't have to like it to know you're safe. So perhaps a healthier mindset might be to say, bring it on. Go on, do your worst. So no matter what happens, you can kind of then learn that rationally, this is the actual movement. I'm strapped in. If I'm strapped to the aircraft, no harm will come to me. What's the worst that's going to happen? Just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's unsafe. 
I could train myself to start to like it because I can see it as a proof of power rather than thinking of it as something that is going to just make us fall out the sky, which it won't. It's a proof of power that air has power. Air is always moving and has this phenomenal power. And thinking about it again, you've got a 410, 400 ton beastie in the air rocketing along at 500 miles an hour, just as a sort of couple of round figures. What would it take to knock that off its course, really? So could it really just be knocked off its course by 3000 feet? No, but it's easy to think like that in our brain because our brain sometimes does our head in. Because there's part of us that wants to beat the fear and there's part of us that wants to keep it because we're fearful thinking, crikey, you know, this thing is just going to, it's just a matter of time before uh, something happens to me. Okay, so final thoughts, turbulence is just movement of air. Uh, nothing will happen to you if you are strapped to the aircraft. You are strapped to the aircraft, you are safe. Okay, and what more of us there to think about? So lastly, it's just movement of air. It's always going to happen. It happens every single flight. You can't predict it. You can have a good go and there's no harm going to come to you. It's just movement. So no biggie. I hope you found that useful and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Take care.